When I was little, my mother used to sing me all the songs of Isaiah. She's dead now. I don't remember anything else about her. None her face, her voice. Any of the expectations or stories she might have had for me. No one else alive knew her. But I remember her songs. She knew music from all over the world. And if I teach them to you, then some part of you can know her. And she can live on a little longer. Where I was born, row chant was the most common of songs. Row chant, or medjulivain, is structured around a unison melody broken up by regular intervals of soloists. These individuals will often play tagle harp, mandolin, drum, flute, or sagal harp, a bowed lyre in the shape of a ship, or, in lieu of any of those, sing a verse during these intervals. Verses like this are passed down through families, but children are eventually expected to write their own twist or improvise on their family line, and bards and scops will write their own from scratch, relevant to whatever current events or artistic preferences they may have. The chorus, however, means that these songs are never lost entirely. During festivals, songs can go on for hours, passing between different singers and instruments. Row chant originated as a way to time the rowing of boats, but Households also sing songs for chores, and shield folk are expected to sing in time to their drills. The earliest songs were surely only vocals, but have been since passed down and sung again and again. Under the Sagari, Ria of Solish, some 400 years ago, as a means of preventing disputes over the true words and original melodies of these songs, many row chants were compiled into a row chant book called the Sagar Nilvain, or The Sage King's Music. Supposedly, there's a first draft of the book somewhere out there, lost to time. The most famous of these songs, the Segari, tells the life and death of Rio Solish. But amusingly, this is one of the few traditionally performed songs that's solely performed by a single bard. Today, the lives of the Sagan are surprisingly filled with song, and even their enemies know to fear them from the beat of their drums in the distance. I grew up listening to the dinner concertos of Novothulian nobility. Ours is focused on a single romantic melody supported by accompaniment, much how the heads of noble houses are the masterminds of our gangs. Categorized by many types of harps, string harps, metal east harps, handheld ring harps, and flutes and dulcimers, vibraphones, and a three-string violin called the iron fiddle. While they share their origins in Sagan songs, Ours grew from shepherds with their echoing herding calls, and miners navigating the mountains. Today, our industrialists are above the need for song to keep the time, but that doesn't mean that the traditions are gone. With the prominence of mages in Thule over the last 400 years, especially with the war recently, our harps have grown grander and thus tied to locations. We don't sing as we move, but to fill the silence at dinners, and to drown out the howling winds of winter. Novothulian music today has become a symbol of refinement and status, and knowing the history behind each song is just as important as performing it properly. So much so that I've seen it used to undermine another lord's status. Many vocalists in particular throughout the years have done variations on popular songs, with embellishments or personal twists of flavor, making it difficult with anyone unfamiliar with the song itself to know if it's a historical count or fantasy story. As such, anyone who doesn't know the true history of a song being sung is looked down upon as an uncultured charlatan. I lost my singing voice long before I could sing any Thulean songs, but my mother would sing their melodies as winding lullabies. I know the Thuleans now. They would have looked down on her for that. Imperial music is focused entirely on the beat and the droning hum of east through bones. 
Theirs is the pounding of their collective hearts, of blood running in their veins, of bodies pressed together in a dark room, and sweet rum, and candles burning. Complicated rhythms and single demons with multiple voices harmonizing with themselves mean that demonic music, no matter how tempting and delightful it may sound, can never fully be understood by a human. It is said that the best demonic musicians will use their songs to entrance humans, lure them away, and eat them. I think my mother told me that if I ever heard these bewitching drums in the woods or in a dark side of town, that I should never follow them. Or perhaps Einhor just said that in a story my mind is attributed to her. I don't know now. Recently in the South, those who have learned to recreate the alien sounds of East running through metal and bone with their instruments and musical armor are labeled as deviants and are said to be making the devil's music since both the abyss and demons are associated with their goddess Eris, goddess of the abyss. But music shouldn't be feared just for what is making the sound. It should be feared for who is playing it. Sonic music, much like Sonic culture, is broad and varied, with many specific traditions coming from certain regions of the after Cretoria. Core among all their songs, however, is their improvisation and harmony. Sonic songs are living and evolving, much like players and life itself. A good Sonic musician will listen to all the other instruments as they add their own riffs and variations, with certain modes and chord progressions corresponding to certain constellations, religious motifs, and other such symbolism. While originating as call and response farming work songs, sonic music has plenty of instrumentation today, with a particular focus on stringed instruments, strummed and plucked and bowed, with both animal strings and metal ones. Tambour and tambourines accompany them, and you can hear hints of the desert with their Shahrizani influence in their most western styles. They're also known for their street organs, sometimes called hurdy-gurdies, which have evolved from their close contact with demons from thousands of years ago. Today, there are no demons in the south, but that does make you wonder why the Inquisition still regulates their music so closely. Telethenians invented prosthetic limbs and clay golems long before they invented wheels or carts. And so, Telethenian music formed long, long ago as an expression of mathematics. One of the examples still sung in schools today is the quarter angle song, which conveys how to calculate the sides of a triangle. Beginning in this way, ancient Telethenian music relied on choirs of voices and vocal harmonies, with each note representing a number. To this day, their choirs and pipe organs still convey this sense of solemn grandeur, though the improvised sonic melodies have warmed them to the music that humans can appreciate for its emotional beauty, rather than for its technically crafted logic. Today, the Aftercratoria, that is, the collective of both the Sphonic and the Telethenians, their music is ethereal and melodic while maintaining elements of its mathematic roots. The Telethenian method of writing music has been adopted the world over as well, though it does demand the standardization of instruments. They write numbers to indicate what string to hit or what key to press, and another number indicates how long a note should be played. This is a relatively new method, however, so it's still being developed, and others are still debating how it should be used and what it really means to use it. Senator Diakaeus has been wanting me to learn Telethenian music. He says it will be good for me, but... 
I, I don't even know my own culture song. I've been, I've been gone for so long. I, Do you ever get the sense, because you're so far from the culture you grew up in, that you're so far from your family, from your mother, from your songs and your language, that it's, it's not really yours anymore? And even if you wanted wanted to know what it would be like to be that other you to be the you that didn't say goodbye and you don't even know how to begin it's all so far away sometimes it feels like if I could just learn one song, just one song in my native tongue, somehow, maybe, I can recapture a part of the me that died with the rest of my family. As an interracial adoptee who isn't really tied into her birth culture, it means a lot to be able to express that frustration through our listener today. Special thanks to Eric, who specializes in game music, music composition, and music history, for working with me to develop the music history and compose the songs that can be found in Isaiah. Working with him means I can go in so much more depth with how the music evolved in my world than I could with just research on my own. He's so passionate and talented, so please give him a look-see in the comment section below. Here on this channel, we are also all extremely passionate about trying to compensate artists fairly and sustainably, but I don't have this channel monetized on YouTube yet, so if you want to support me and my growing network of artists, please check out my unconventional art book, link in the doobly doo. This year, to celebrate Isaiah Week, we are releasing a paper tour of Isaiah. When I went to Japan a while back, I got all of these flyers and stuff, or like fans that were ha handed out in the street as advertisements, so I wanted to recreate that with Isaiah since you can't actually visit there. It'll come with illustrated letters, diary entries, tarot cards, patches, recipes, language learning tools, and digital ambience rooms, so while you're reading or compiling it into your own fantasy journal, you can listen and fully immerse yourself into the world of Isaiah. It's only $5, but every purchase buys an indie artist a bubble tea. So thanks so much in advance. Take care.